Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to Lakeside Open Bible Community Church Online, right here in Dexter, Oregon. If you joined us last week, then you may recall our study of the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and our Lord and Savior's glorious ascension in Acts chapter 1. I want to encourage each of you to continue to read the book of Acts as we'll pick up our study of that amazing record of the early church event in just a few weeks. I'd like to read with you a prayer, a prayer of national revival for us in this time. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray, we pray now for this great sleeping giant, the church, who even now has begun to shake herself from her sleep. We pray that she would awake to righteousness and holiness in every denomination and every body of believers and slumber no longer. We pray we would begin to unify under the blood-stained banner of the cross and preach the gospel of the kingdom clearly and boldly in every highway and byway of our nation. We pray that we will not only stand up and speak up, but that we will begin to reap a great harvest in our nation, bringing multitudes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. May this revival of the saints be so encompassing, be so encompassing, Lord, that it affects the spiritual complexion of our entire nation and influences our politics, our economy, our media, and our entire society. Father God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, dear ones, as you know, is Mother's Day. My wife Kathy and I will be personally contacting and delivering to some of your homes today some gifts for our moms. But let not your hearts be troubled, for we will all be together again in person here at our Father's house again very soon. In fact, we're planning right now a parking lot service, if you will, a drive-in theater type parking lot service right here on Sunday, May 31st at 10.30 a.m. We will be spacing our cars, yes, six feet apart, and transmitting right into your very own vehicles as well as using outdoor speakers. So mark your calendars for May 31st and plan now to attend right here in our parking lot. Today I have the privilege and honor to introduce to you a friend and colleague of mine, one of our Lakeside pastoral staff and our worship leader, Pastor Phil McKinnis. So would you please help me welcome Pastor Phil as he shares today a message for Mother's Day. Pastor Phil, thank you. Starting out with worship, and the um, first song is Gracefully Broken. So that's not exactly the message for the mothers today, although it might be appropriate. Jesus. 
Let's do this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. Today I'm going to be teaching on the heart of the godly mother and how it bears much fruit. Mother-in-laws get no respect. In a matter of fact, a young married woman was complaining to her husband, you hate my relatives. And he responded by saying, no I don't. In fact, I like your mother-in-law more than I like mine. Again, mother-in-laws get no respect. In fact, they have become the brunt of many jokes. For example, one joke state, I always know when my mother-in-law knocks at my door because the mice jump in the traps. Mother-in-laws get no respect. While many of the jokes are meant to be funny, they are evidence of this truth, and that's that many people don't have a good relationship with their mother-in-laws. And that is what makes this story especially significant and amazing. It gives us a hope for our own relationships as it provides a godly example for us to follow. The heroine of our story is named Naomi. The story begins with famine in 
Bethlehem, and a journey to Moab, which by all appearance was a place of life, hope, and blessing. Naomi, her husband Elimelech, Elimelech and their two sons, Malon and Kilia, went to Moab. Moab was a small kingdom on top of a fertile plateau just east of the Dead Sea, which meant there was food. So what could go wrong, right? In a time of famine, you want to be at a place that has food. Again, what could go wrong? Well, things started going wrong. First, Elimelech, Elimelech died, and while his death did bring heartache, obviously, to Naomi, she was still okay because she had her sons. Her sons ended up marrying Moabite women named Orpah and Ruth. They were all one happy family until the unthinkable. Naomi's sons died, leaving her with only, only her foreign daughter-in-laws. They were no longer bound to her by marriage, only by relationship. She was desolate, in despair, and ready to go back home in Bethlehem. And this is where our text begins. Our text is Ruth chapter 1, verses 6 through 18. The first thing that we learn from our text is that the heart of a godly mother bears much fruit through tenderness. Verses 6 through 9 say, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Verse 8. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. Naomi's tenderness is exemplified by her broken heart, which initially was implied because her husbands and sons had died, and she obviously was going through grief. But later it was demonstrated further the depths of the grief that she was feeling. The important thing to know about tender-hearted people is that people who are the most tender-hearted are often the ones who experience grief most fully. For example, I get to go into senior homes and provide support for staff and for residents and often it's the caregivers who provide the most loving, supportive care who experience the greatest depths of grief. They love, they adopt people as their grandparents or parents, and it really hurts when they lose them. Keeping this in mind, I think about how devastating it must have been for Naomi. She had gone to Moab with everything. She had a husband, she had sons, she had hopes, dreams, and a means of carrying on the family line, as well as a means of survival. Now she had nothing. She was desolate. She was re returning to Judah in desolation. This is evidenced by her words that she later spoke as she entered into Bethlehem. This is found in verses 20 and 21. So I kind of shot ahead of the text just to grab this back to give us a, a glimpse of how she was feeling. Verses 20 and 21 said, and I will have to tell you that people were excited about her return. They said, is that Naomi? There's the celebration and excitement, and she's not excited. She's feeling the depths of her loss. But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, 
Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again, empty. So she left full and returned empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me? The Almighty has afflicted me. The name Mara means bitter, or that the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. The name Naomi, in contrast, meant pleasant. Names during that time were very descriptive of an individual and their traits. And so it's important as she renames herself. Says, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. Her bitterness or the feelings of bitterness, the feelings of abandonment from God even make it more significant that she was able to, to give tenderness and, and behave tenderly towards her daughters-in-laws. One of the most difficult experiences for people is when a spouse or a child dies. I remember when my grandfather Simpson died my grandma wanted to die too. Naomi lost both her spouse and her children. So I can imagine how she must have felt. The miracle of Naomi's tenderness is not that she was able to grieve. That probably came around naturally. The miracle of her tenderness is that in spite of her grief, she was still able to express love through kindness. And this is displayed ultimately in her kissing her daughter-in-laws. This proves that the heart of a mother is able to bear much fruit, even in the midst of grief, as the mother draws closer to God, receives God's comfort, and then shares it with others. 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, verses 3 through 4 is an important verse for us to remember when we are going through difficult times. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. As we live life and go through difficult times, God is working in our life, bringing about comfort and good, and making us into vessels that carry His comfort and can be used in the life of other people. In the midst of desolation, Naomi's tenderness is expressed by her comforting love. Verses 6 and 7, or in verses 6 and 7, Naomi demonstrated her comforting love in that she did not leave her daughters-in-law to grieve alone. She was with them. It's also demonstrated when it says that she arose with them. Arising is a sign of hope. It was the first step of Naomi and her daughter-in-law's climbing out of the pit of despair that they had fallen into. For my grandmother, arising meant accepting the loss of my grandfather and deciding to live again. After that, she lived a fulfilled life. Naomi, when she arose, she had not seen the blessing yet. She had only heard about the blessing. So it was a step of faith. It was natural for Naomi to return to her people, which included her extended family, because that's what any of us would do if we're in a foreign country and we lose our loved ones that are with us. We would want to go be with our family, extended family who are back home. So for her it was natural, but yet for, for Ruth, and Orpha, it was not the natural thing because that was not their people. It was not their family. For them, it was also a step of faith. 
God gives mothers both wisdom and faith to be lived out as examples for their children to follow. I remember my grandma McKinnis, she's passed away now, but she was a very loving person. I will have to say Grandma Simpson was very loving too. But there's something about Grandma McKinnis that just made you want to be like her. And really what it was, it was the love she extended to not only family, but to others as well. And she was a little bit on the radical side with her love because she would go and she would preach to people who were drunk outside taverns telling them to repent. Other times she would hand out blankets and pillows to people who had passed out on the sidewalks just because she didn't want to see them uncomfortable. She really had a Christ-like love that was displayed and was an example for others to follow. Who wouldn't want to be like her? Naomi was the same way. All of us should be learning from the godly examples around us and implementing what we've learned and living it out so others can learn from our own example. Now we're going to talk about verses 8 and 9 specifically. At first glance, it appears that Naomi's faith falters. Like Peter, when he was walking on water, as he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to sink. This happens when, when she tells Ruth and Orpah, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of your husband. And it may have been and it may have been faltering faith when she expressed that. And yet, what is more evident is Naomi's attempt to place the welfare of her daughters-in-law, who really had become her daughters, before her own welfare. And that is an expression of love. For Ruth and Orpah, there was no welfare available where they were living or where they were going to be going, which is Bethlehem. And they had no extended family there. And on top of that, they would have been looked down on as being Moabites or strangers in the land. Her prayer for them is also evidence of her love, which was a self-sacrificing love, which I believe that God gives all mothers for their children. It is seen in 8b and 9 when she says, The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. This is evidence of her continued faith in God. She was looking for God to provide for them in their former situation back at their homes. A mother's love is most fruitful when it's combined with faith. The fruit of Naomi's love and faith was the devotion her daughters-in-law had for her. They not only cried, but they followed her. They were willing to give up their own mothers and time with their own mothers for her sake. And that speaks of the depth of, of her love for them. Now, mothers... You have a great opportunity to bear fruit in the life of your children as you identify with their painful experiences, provide a godly example, and as you provide comfort for them during their times of struggle. The second thing we learn from our text is that a heart or the heart of a godly mother bears much fruit through truthfulness. Now, in this portion of scripture, which is will be verses 10 through 14, we see Naomi as, as cutting to the heart of the issue. She's a straight shooter. It says, they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that I may be? 
that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi gave them both a reality check. First of all, she had no sons for them. And second of all, there was no future or no perceivable future if they stayed with her. Her advice or, or her question she gave them about sons really reflects back to Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 6, which says, If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of the husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son, which she bears, will succeed to be the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So Naomi was really upholding or wishing she could uphold this tradition that is found in Deuteronomy 25 of, of keeping it within the family. And so her son's name wouldn't be blotted out. She would love to have that take place and to continue to have, to have Ruth and Orpah as daughters. And yet she realizes that she is unable to provide that for them. It isn't even anything that would ever uh, have a chance. This really grieved Naomi that she could not provide for their needs. And what is interesting, she didn't say this grieves me because I will, my, my, my line or my lineage ends right here because I'll never have children which means I'll never have grandchildren and, and, and they'll never have children and, and grandchildren. She didn't focus on her own needs. Her mother's love caused her to focus on the needs or the loss of her daughters-in-laws. Oftentimes you hear people say, God, why has this happened to me? Or why did you allow this to happen to me? And it's all about them, but not for Naomi. She grieved because, because the way her loss affected the lives of her daughters-in-law who she loved. Her statement was spoken out of grief and in love. It would have been easy for her to try to manipulate them using her grief or even looking at her own needs, and even perhaps holding back the truth from them, right? She didn't have to tell them, you're never going to, you know, I'm never going to have sons for you to marry, and, you know, she could have just kind of kept that to herself and just gone on her way. And yet, her heart of, of a mother didn't allow her to. It was the fruit of Naomi's truthfulness that caused Orpha to kiss her and then go back to her own home and maybe have a good life even, while Ruth ended up clinging to her in love. One thing we can learn about the heart of the mother when it comes to Naomi is that while she said, go home, she didn't command them to and then she gave them questions that allowed them to decide on their own. So they weren't coerced. 
It was by their own love, then, that they either went home or stayed. Wonderful example of how to use questions in a way that can promote good in the life of those that we love. So mothers, you have a great opportunity to bear life in the lives of your children as you speak truth and love. You are not responsible for their responses. You might even be disappointed by them. But ultimately, it is God's responsibility to work in their life through the truth that you have expressed. So pray for your children. Speak the truth in love. Continue to love them, but put it in God's hands. The third thing we learn from our text is that the heart of a godly mother bears much fruit through transformation. Or we might say it this way, a godly mother's love is transforming. Verses 15 through 18 say, And she said, Look at your sister. Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Doesn't mean that she was mad at her, so she wasn't going to say another word. What it means is that she quit trying to compel her to go back to her own people. It was the love of a mother that transformed Ruth caused her to not only leave her people and leave her gods, but cling to Ruth. There's three nuggets related to this and Naomi's influence in Ruth's transformation that I'm going to highlight right now. The first is that Naomi's love for Ruth became a bridge to Ruth's own salvation. We see this as, as Naomi's God becomes her God. Also, we see it as, as relationally and as in marriage and in sustenance, she also finds salvation and will, that brings us to number two. The second nugget is that Naomi's love for Ruth became a bridge to Ruth's future. As Ruth fell in love with Boaz, her redeemer, they had a child named Obed, who was the father of Jesse, the father of King David. Can you imagine that? The great-grandmother of King David was a Gentile. So what is our responsibility? And I'll get to the third one. But what is our responsibility or the mother's responsibility when it comes to your own children. First of all, when it comes to salvation and transformation, share Jesus, pray for them, read the Bible to them. Second of all, when it comes to how things work out in life and just their welfare, affirm and support their future. Help them overcome obstacles. That is what godly mothers do. The third nugget, ultimately, Naomi's faithfulness as a mother blessed not only Ruth, but has blessed the whole world as Ruth, a Gentile, became an ancestress of Jesus himself. Can you imagine, in Jesus' lineage is this Gentile named Ruth, who clung on to Naomi because of her love. God can do wonderful things in your life as you love others, as you use that giftedness that God has given you as a mother 
as it is shared with others, wonderful, blessed things will happen. In conclusion, I'd like you to think about this. In spite of Naomi's own grief, her persistent or her persistence to view things within the context of her grief and her culture, and what had been made it may have been a lack of faith at times, she was able to provide love, guidance, and opportunity for Ruth so that she could be redeemed in both a material sense and a spiritual sense. This is because the heart of a godly mother bears much fruit. Mothers, it's my prayer for you today that your life will bear much fruit. I'm going to conclude by reading Psalm 1, verses 3 through 1, which is God's promise of fruitfulness. I have purposely and appropriately genderized it. So mothers, this is for you specifically. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but her delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law she meditates day and night. She shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever she does shall prosper. God bless you, and may you prosper, and may your family prosper, as God's love is displayed through your mother's heart. Thank you.